Welcome to Hope Hospice's Family Caregiver Education Series. I'm Debbie Emerson, Hope's Community Health Educator and Certified Dementia Specialist. My primary responsibility at HOPE is developing and managing our family caregiver education program. And my goal is always to bring presentations to you that contain valuable information about all aspects of providing care to those we love. So today we are fortunate to have as our guest speaker, Julie Fiedler, a local attorney who's been dedicated to protecting the rights of elders and families for over 35 years. Julie has been gracious enough to present for us over the past several years, so I know you're going to be in really good hands today. I'm often asked by caregivers um, if I can recommend an elder law attorney or an estate planner. So I just want to highlight four resources to help you in your search. Now, you can contact the National Association of Elder Law Attorneys, um, California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, or CANR, is one of my very favorite resources. Um, they're very responsive to emails and phone calls, and their title is actually a little bit deceptive because they do so much more than just advocating for persons residing in nursing homes. They have excellent information on their website about Medi-Cal, elder abuse, and just lots and lots more. The Family Caregiver Alliance is another one of my trusted go-to online resources. They have lots of great information about many of today's topics. And of course, Julie Fiedler is my go-to referral in the Tri-Valley area. So it's now my pleasure to formally introduce our guest presenter and share just a few items from her resume. Uh, Julie Fiedler is a certified elder law attorney, and she's also a registered nurse, so it's a great combination. Um, I mentioned earlier that she has over 35 years of experience in healthcare and senior services. Julie served two terms on the board of directors for the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, and she's the past president for the Northern California chapter of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorney, Attorneys. She's accredited by the Department of Veterans Affairs to help individuals in all matters involving VA benefits. And if you've ever tried to navigate veterans benefits on your own, uh, you know how difficult and frustrating this can be. And when I did this for my mom about 14 years ago, I sure wish I'd had someone to help me who knew the system and who could advocate on our behalf. Julie is also an active member of CANR, California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform. So Julie, again, thank you so much for presenting to our group today. On that note, I do wanna thank Debbie for allowing me to do this presentation. As she mentioned, I've done it several times in the past and it's always been a, a great time of, of sharing information. I, you know, and we've always had really good audiences, really good questions. And I do encourage you to ask questions. Um, what I plan on doing is kind of doing a general overview, and then it's kind of naturally broken up into sections of, of topics. And what I'll do, do pretty much is at the end of a, a general topic, I'll, I'll stop for a moment and have Debbie check and see if there's any questions, answer them at that time when it's sort of a fresh question, and then move on to the next area. So uh, feel free as I'm talking if something comes up put the question in there. I won't necessarily answer it that second, but um, by the end of the presentation, hopefully we will get all the questions answered. Sometimes people have very specific questions to their situation that um, may take a little bit more of an explanation and maybe maybe doesn't interest everybody. And if that's the case, sometimes, you know, it might be better that I talk to you in, you know, at the end of the session or where we can talk another time. Um, just because, you know, when you get into the, the specifics, every situation is a little bit different. So what we're doing today is kind of a general overview, sort of a bird's eye view of all of these issues. It's certainly not the end of the discussion. It's more the beginning of the discussion, but it should um, answer questions that you have, as well as possibly raising more questions like, oh, I didn't think of that. What should I do about that? You know, that sort of thing. So on that note, I, let me just get started with um, just letting you know that, that generally 
when we're looking at estate planning and um, healthcare planning, we always want to keep people as independent as possible for as long as possible. Nobody wants to lose control over their lives. So the, the basic premise is that everyone has the capacity to make their own decisions, manage their own healthcare, manage their own finances until such time as they're unable to. And there's always a question of at what point are they unable to? I've had a lot of people come and say, well, the doctor says that she can't sign legal documents. Well, technically the law doesn't say that the doctor has that authority. The doctor certainly can say, yeah, I don't think that you know your mom understands or that sort of thing. <clears throat> but as far as the ability to sign documents, it's considered a civil right. And in order to lose that right, only a judge can say, you lack the capacity and are no longer allowed to sign documents um, to make decisions and somebody else will take over. So a doctor's recommendations go into that, but every person is always given the opportunity to say, wait a minute, I'm fine, I can do this. And then a judge would determine. And at the point that a judge determines you can no longer make decisions, sign legal documents, that's when you're, you're your situation is kind of set in stone. Somebody else takes over and you really don't, you don't have that authority anymore. So our goal is always for people to do planning in advance while you still can, um, while you know kind of what you want. Although, you know, life throws all kinds of crazy twists at us. So we can't really um, predict every kind of situation, but we can certainly arrange so that if at any time we're not able to make healthcare decisions or financial decisions, or decisions about where we live, if we need to move to a facility because the level of care we need is more than we can handle at home, that we've set something up in advance where someone else has the legal authority to make those decisions for us, sign contracts, that sort of thing, as well as make decisions about, you know, what care level do we need and where do we need to receive that care and that sort of thing. So if you've already set that up in advance, it's a lot more likely that you're going to have things go the way you wanted it to go, rather than if you just kind of leave it up in the air. Um, if you do not have any kind of documents in place and something does happen where you lose capacity, uh, the next step is generally conservatorship, which is through the probate court, where the judge basically, as I said, determines you can't make these decisions. The judge will appoint someone else to. It's usually a family member, but it kind of depends, again, on your situation. And through the conservatorship proceeding, decisions will be made on your behalf. Um, they always go through a judge. There's attorneys involved, so people are looking out for your interests, but not necessarily what you would have chosen. So I highly recommend that, you know, as we talk about certain documents that everyone should have from the time you're 18 years old to the time you die, certain things that everyone should have. So if you don't have them or you created them 20, 30 years ago that you update them and that way we can avoid that whole probate proceeding during your life. And then people have often heard about probate after you die, which is also in the probate court. It's just an, an estate administration because now you're gone. Who's supposed to get your money? Um, and again, that, that's run through the judge. If you have a will, but um, it's subject to probate, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, then it's the court's responsibility to enforce that will. If you have no documents, no will, no nothing, then essentially everything's gonna go to next of kin. That's kind of the way it works, which in some cases is not a bad thing. In some cases, it's a terrible thing. <laughs> you know, if you have estranged family members, if you have disabled family members, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, issues that, again, you want to try and set that up in advance so that you're not at the mercy of whatever the statute says. So um, so that being said, and then the other thing is health care. Again, that's not so much after you die, but during, during life, if you've set up a health care directive, you've named somebody that has that legal authority to make decisions for you, and you've given some guidance. When we do the legal documents, that's not it certainly doesn't cover everything. As a matter of fact, the legal documents are pretty general. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the Pulsed document. 
That's the Physician's Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment, P-O-L-S-T. And that gets into more specifics of the end of life kind of decisions. So that's things like, do you wanna be on a ventilator if you're not able to breathe well? Do you want dialysis if your kidneys shut down? Do you want tube feedings? You know, things like that. Do you want CPR? I, again, making those decisions in advance and saying, here's my wishes, you know, and it's again, more likely they will be honored if you have expressed those. So that pulse document is actually a doctor's order. So that's done through your doctor, sometimes a nurse practitioner, that's not done through the lawyer. Um, the legal documents are generally done through the lawyer, although you can do those documents without a lawyer, especially the healthcare directive. That's one thing that I really don't push that you necessarily need a lawyer. I know Kaiser has their own forms and they're fine. Um, there's, there's a number of forms I can't remember the one that um, I want to say five wishes. I think it's called five wishes, which is a great form where it actually gets into a little bit more specifics of what you want than an attorney drafted form. So again, you know, whatever format you have, it just, it just needs to be a fairly standard form. Don't just, you know, pick something up with that that has no background. I mean, if it's if it's a recognized form. Um, an advanced healthcare directive form for California, then it would be it would be honored in California. And even if you have California documents and you move to another state, those states do have to honor the documents that you've done here. Although I generally recommend, and most attorneys recommend, if you're moving permanently to another state, the the healthcare directive and the power of attorney are so state specific that it's a good idea to try to assign new ones under that state's laws. Now, if you have a trust or a will, you don't necessarily have to do that. But those two documents, the healthcare directive and the power of attorney are two documents that, are, that I do recommend that you create under the laws of the state you're living in. Which of course, right now we're talking California. Um, so, uh, the, the document that I do recommend an attorney do is the durable power of attorney. There are some situations where someone's estate is so simple and things, things um, can be run through what's called a statutory power of attorney, which is one that you can get off, off the web. Um, you can print it and sign it. And I'll tell people, you know, when they call me, you know, we'll go over the situation. And if their situation is such that one of those is fine, I'll tell them, go get that free document and do this. You don't need to pay me uh, for, you know, a more robust one. But for most people, you do want more of that robust language in that power of attorney that really gives your agent the authority to do whatever needs to be done. The statutory one can handle the basics of, well, if you can't pay your bills, they can pay your bills for you. But there's a lot of things under that that they couldn't do. Just a lot of nuances that, especially as we are aging longer and sometimes needing help for a longer period of time, there is some planning that, that can be done, but only if your power of attorney gives your agent the authority to do that kind of planning. So I do recommend usually a, a, an attorney drafted power of attorney. Um, but again, both of these documents are part of what we call an estate plan. I do have people that say, oh, I don't have an estate. Well, you know, an estate doesn't necessarily mean you're wealthy. It can, but not necessarily. An estate is just anything that you have. Even it's just basic, you know, paying your rent at your apartment, paying your bills, your, you know, your um, checking account, if that's all you have, it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's your estate. And again, you are responsible over your own estate for as long as you can be. And that's where the power of attorney, or I'll talk about trust too, would, would kick in if you're not able to manage it. Then through those documents, you have named someone that has the legal authority to take over your estate. However, complicated or simple it is. Um, without those documents, if something happens to you, um, generally you are gonna end up in the court system 
trying to get a conservator to be able to make those decisions. And it's not generally you, it's the family member. So, you know, when you create your estate plan, you're really doing it almost as a service to your family who's going to be stuck with, what do I do now that mom's incapacitated and can't act and doesn't have documents? Um, so, and, and same with, you know, if you're helping a, a, a parent or something, if you can help them get their documents in place, it's going to make life a lot easier for you when the time comes that somebody needs to help. The other two primary documents in an estate plan are a will and a trust. And I wanna explain the difference in those. So a will basically says, and I mean, everybody knows this, when I die, here's where I want my property to go. And generally it says, here's who I want to be my executor of my estate to make everything go where it's supposed to go. Um, and that's, that's great. And again, depending on what your estate is comprised of, the, the problem is if you have too much, the state of California, you know, sometimes it gets confusing when you say the state and the estate. So I try and say the state of California has an interest in making sure your property goes somewhere. They don't like property just lingering out there with no owner, mostly because they want to get their taxes. You know, so you have real estate out there and there's nobody claiming ownership they're not going to get their property taxes, you know, for example. So that's, you know, that's kind of the bottom line, but there are other reasons for the state wanting property to move on. So um, California has a minimum, I guess it's a minimum level that if you go above that level, uh, then it, you would be thrown into the probate, um, the probate estate management. And right now that level, and it just changed. It's 188,000 something. I always forget because they have odd numbers. Anyway, it's about $188,000. Now, when, they, when you're looking at your estate to see how much we have, not everything is counted in that 188,000. So what counts in the 188,000 is things that don't have some sort of pay on death designation. So if you have life insurance and there's a beneficiary, that's not going to go through probate. That's going to go based on the beneficiary and your life insurance. Same with an IRA, Roth IRA, pension, 401k, those kinds of things that have a, a beneficiary listed in, in the account itself. Those are not part of your estate as far as what's what would potentially go through probate. Those are just done directly as a matter of law. The other kind of ownership you can have is what we call joint tenancy. Oftentimes that's a husband and wife are both on, on a bank account, or maybe you have a child on your bank account and, and you're both co-owners. And if either one of you dies, it automatically goes to the other person. Um, I mentioned something about having kids on your account. I do want to talk about that later, that it's not usually a very good idea, but just an example of how, and actually I could probably talk about it now, is that um, if you have that kind of co-ownership, as I said, that property will automatically go to the co-owner. So if you have five kids and you put one of your kids on your account just to help you out, but there's no, but I mean, that's where the bulk of your money is that child is going to inherit everything in that account and they have absolutely no legal duty to share with their siblings. They may, but they may not. And there's no legal obligation. So generally, except for small working accounts where, you know, there's not a lot in it, we generally recommend that you don't put a child or some other person, you know, a spouse is one thing, but um, someone else on that account as a co-owner or a joint tenant. But generally what we recommend on accounts like that, if you're not going to put them in a trust, and I'll talk about the trust in a bit, um, is to have a pay on death designation. So even when we create trusts, a lot of times I tell people, don't put your checking account in the trust because just the act of changing title from you as an individual to your trust will usually change your account number. So if you have automatic payments, automatic withdrawals, automatic deposits all set up, that's going to mess everything up when you change the account number. So generally in a situation like that, we'll say, 
We'll create the trust. We'll put your investment accounts, your real estate. And again, I'll talk about that. But all that's titled in the trust. But let's say you're keeping your checking account out. We want you to have your power of attorney on file so that during life, if anything happens to you, your trusted person can take over immediately, start signing checks, handling business. Um, and then when you die, the bank will already have that designation on the account that says pay on death to, and usually we'll say pay on death to the trust, the trustee of the trust, and that way it funnels everything through the trust. Without that kind of pay on death designation, it's not the end of the world, but any accounts that are just in your name when you die and you don't have a co-owner, they will be frozen for a period of 40 days. Like I say, not the end of the world. Usually when somebody dies, there's so much going on. 40 days does go by fairly quickly. But nevertheless, that money is not available to anyone for 40 days. And even then, there's a legal thing that you have to do to claim it. Like not, a, not a terribly difficult thing, but it can be avoided by just putting pay on death designations on any accounts where you're the sole owner that you've decided not to put in the trust. So let me kind of go back and talk about what is a trust. A trust actually acts as a will, but it does more than that. So whereas the will just says, here's where my property goes and here's the person who can send it there. The trust actually holds property during your life so that if something happens to you, somebody else can take over, everything stays in your trust. But even as, as to you, you're the beneficiary of the trust. So as the creator of the trust, you put your property in there, you still have full rights over, over the assets in the trust. You're still the beneficiary. So everything in that trust is, is managed for your benefit. And initially you're in charge at any time that you put someone else in charge. So let's say you're older and you just, I want my daughter to handle everything. I'm going to make my daughter the trustee of the trust. Then she gets put on title as trustee of the trust, not as a, not as a personal owner, but she's the, the manager of the trust. And then she's the one that has authority to make decisions, write checks, do whatever it is that needs to be done under any property that's in that trust. So when you create the trust, you're saying here, you know, essentially I'm the initial person creating it. I'm the trustee managing it and I'm the beneficiary. If something happens and I become incapacitated and I can't manage the money anymore, I'm still the beneficiary, it's still my money, but because I can't manage it, we can have a successor trustee step in, basically a new manager, and yet they're still managing it for our benefit. And then at the point that we die, the trust document itself says, here's what happens when I die. Obviously now we've got different beneficiaries. I'm gone, I'm not a, a beneficiary anymore. So at that point, wherever it is that you've decided you want it to go, you can have very specific provisions in the trust that it goes out right to whoever. There can be charities, um, it can be your kids, it can be anybody that you want. Um, you also can put a lot of flexible language, which is something that we do. If you were to have a beneficiary that's disabled and, and potentially, <clears throat> excuse me, getting, um, benefits like SSI or Medi-Cal benefits, where if they have too much money, they would lose their benefits. So we don't necessarily want them to inherit money outright because then they lose all their government benefits and all the things that the government was helping pay for, they have to pay for themselves. The next thing you know, their inheritance is gone. And now they're back to the government benefits with no, no assets to subsidize that. Whereas under the trust, you can create a special needs trust for a beneficiary. So it stays in trust, someone else is managing it. They don't lose their government benefits, but that money can be used to supplement, just to give them a better quality of life, get them things that, that the government's not gonna pay for. It just, you know, that way they're getting their inheritance, but it's not causing them more problems than good. So it's those kinds of things that in a trust, we can really be a lot more creative based on your circumstances. The other thing, I had somebody just email me this morning about she has separate property from her husband and she doesn't mind her husband being in charge, but if something happens to him and then something happens to her, right now they have 
his sister as the successor trustee, but she says, I don't want her in charge of my separate property that goes to my kids. So I want to have different provisions so that one person can manage our joint, you know, spousal property, but I want somebody else to manage my separate property that goes straight to my kids. So again, those kinds of flexible provisions are all possible in a trust. So when we create the trust, we obviously figure out, you know, who are the players? What, what do we want to happen? We draft the documents, we sign the documents, and then that trust is now officially in play. Um, it is under your social security number, so it doesn't need a separate tax ID number until the time you die. When you die, then your social security number goes away, and at that point, it gets a new tax ID number. But during life, <clears throat> for income tax purposes, it's still you. It's basically what we call a see-through trust. So, so you've created it, but until there's property owned by it, it doesn't control anything. So a really important step of creating a trust is, is funding it. Generally, when you're working with an attorney, we usually do the, the um, real estate because that's done by a deed that gets recorded with the county recorder. And again, you're changing your name from just a simple owner of this property to the trustee of your trust owning the property. And then what happens when you die is the trust didn't die. So the trust doesn't disappear. We just get a new trustee so that it continues with the same ownership under the trust, just with a new trustee, as opposed to if you hold title on your house, just with your name, when you die, there is no owner. Again, that's what throws you into probate court, you know, because we need an owner. So once you've transferred title by doing the deed, recording it with the county recorder, that's now covered under the trust. With bank accounts and investment accounts, essentially you do the same thing, but you're doing it with the institution, wherever the, the asset is. So if you have a Charles Schwab account, you're going to notify them. I have a new trust. I want to change my accounts to the new trust. You'll give them the title of the trust, and then they'll have you sign documents there to change the title on the account to your trust. Same thing with banks, you know, just regular savings accounts. You're just going to notify them. I have a trust. I want to change title to my trust. They've been around for a really long time now. So I don't know of any financial institution that isn't going to know what to do. They're going to have their own forms that you'll sign. But essentially, that will change those accounts from you as an individual to you as trustee of your trust. So when you create a trust, it's really important that we look at all of your assets and see what needs to be titled in the trust, what needs beneficiary designation. Um, one thing, you know, with, with retirement accounts, I, I've had people, as a matter of fact, I have one recently where the husband and wife had joint, or not joint, but, but mirror images <clears throat> on their, on their IRAs, husband died, wife inherited his IRA, and now she's got her IRA plus his IRA, which she's merged together, and then she doesn't change her beneficiary, it's still the husband, because she forgot. You know, so then what happens when she dies, which is what's happened in this current situation, is that now there's no beneficiary because the husband's gone. So it's really important that that you double check your beneficiary designations, especially if somebody that you named has died. I've had a lot of younger people name their parents as beneficiaries. And then, you know, life goes on years and years and years. Their parents die. They never even think about it again. So when we're doing an estate plan, it's always important to look at, do I have beneficiary designations on my pensions, on my life insurance, um, you know, IRAs, whatever, um, you know, so that so that those kinds of things, sometimes annuities, there's different things that, that um, operate by beneficiary designation rather than being owned by the trust. So we want to transfer title in investment accounts, um, you know, stocks and bonds that you have, uh, you know, the, any real estate, those kinds of things go on the trust, the, the retirement accounts, life insurance, those sorts of things are done by beneficiary designation. Now, those sometimes... The trust can be a beneficiary of those. We often do that with life insurance so that, again, everything funnels together through the trust and then ultimately distributes out to whoever is supposed to get it. Um, with, with IRAs and other retirement accounts, we often don't want those to go through the trust. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> 
mostly because IRS rules and trust rules are not in, incredibly compatible. You know, the IRS does not talk to every state about their, their trust rules to see if it, if, you know, if it's compatible. So oftentimes, if you name your trust as a beneficiary, it can mess up the IRA um, just in, in uh, tax issues. So now sometimes it's okay. So again, I, I don't want to say never, but it's something that you always want to look into at the time that you're looking at your estate plan. Do I want my trust or do I just want individuals to get it directly? And of those individuals, are any of them disabled? Do we want it to go into a special needs trust for that disabled individual um, as opposed to outright, which again, can cause problems. Um, and there are ways of doing that. So again, one, one of the things we're looking at is what do you currently have? How is it titled? What beneficiary designations do you have? <coughs> and who are the players in your life? Who are the people that you trust to take over, to manage when you're not able to? And who are the people that you want to inherit or charities or whatever? Um, so we look at all those things and then we draft the appropriate documents, get everything funded in the trust that's supposed to be, make sure your beneficiary designations are done, and then you are good to go. If anything happens to you legally, you are protected. You should never need to go to court for any of that stuff. The only times I've ever seen where someone with a good estate plan had to go to court with for a conservatorship was when they had dementia where they were paranoid and they went to the bank and they said, my daughter's stealing from me. Don't let her touch anything. Well, the bank doesn't know. So the bank will at that point freeze things. And even though you have the best documents in the world, if the principal is there saying, no, 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 they are revocable documents. At that point, if the, if you are saying, you know, I don't want my daughter doing this and there's nobody else named, that's where your daughter would have to go to court and say, hey, she trusted me. Look at, here's the documents when she trusted me. Here's the doctor's, you know, declaration saying she has dementia and she's paranoid and that's why she's trying to revoke it. But again, at that point, you're in the conservatorship court. But I've rarely, rarely seen that happen. Um, so for the most part, once you have those documents done, everything's funded properly, you should never have to go to court, which is always my goal. Courts are never fun. They're very, very extended proceedings just because they're, they're so backed up that even a simple thing, you're going to have to wait four or five months to get a court hearing. And sometimes it'll take more than one. And then you keep waiting and waiting. So having these documents is going to save you a lot of time. Plus, they're expensive. Anything, anytime you're dealing with the court, they're going to charge you for every little thing just because that's what the government does. So having these things done in advance is going to save you money, ultimately save you time. And the other thing it does is it saves you privacy. Your documents are private. They only go to the people you've given them to. Whereas once you get into the probate court, anyone can access those records and they can find out all kinds of things about you. And I hate to say it, but people do. You know, I've had a number of probates. The minute we open, I get phone calls from realtors that, oh, you know, I have an interest in your estate. And they'll get me on the phone and say, what do you mean you have an interest? You went to the court and you found out we, we filed a probate. And now suddenly you're sticking your nose in it. We don't want you, you know. So again, we want to keep things as private as we can. And staying out of the court is definitely the way to do that. So essentially, those are the primary estate planning documents that we really recommend everyone have. And again, whether or not you have an estate big enough for a trust or just a will, you know, if, um, if you don't have much, the will sometimes is enough. Um, if you have a trust, we will usually also do a will just to catch anything that you didn't title in the trust or anything that comes into your estate after you died so that it would then funnel into the trust. We call that a pour over will. So rather than acting as a will that says it goes to my three kids or whatever, it says, I want everything to go into my trust. So we generally do those, those two documents together, the trust and the will. I always recommend the power of attorney and healthcare directive. Then certainly if you own any kind of corporations, you know, shares of LLCs, sole proprietorship businesses. There's other documents that we do in order to title those in the trust. 
Um, if you have minor children, we do nominate guardians for those minor children if you're not able to take care of them, whether again from incapacity or death. And unfortunately, I'm getting a lot of young people that have, have had both of those issues with the parents um, where we've got young kids. And so we want to make sure that we've got something set up for the kids, which is what the parent wants, as opposed to the court just stepping in and saying, okay, this person's going to be in charge over your kids. And then maybe it's somebody you couldn't stand during life. You know, it's the last person you wanted. So you want to do those. But again, that's more for younger people to have, to have young children. One more quick thing is if you are raising grandchildren, which a lot of people are these days, um, when you go by the rules of intestacy, which is the court uh, procedure, if you don't have a will or a trust, the grandchildren are not, are not seen as your children, even if you're raising them as your own. So you definitely want documents that protect if you want them to inherit. Maybe your child is you know, on drugs or something like that. You don't want money to go directly to them, but you've been raising their kid forever and you want money to go to them. You need to have good documents that say that because otherwise, and I, again, I've seen this where by default, the drug abusing child inherits everything and oftentimes it kills them. They overdose, you know, and that grandchild who was doing well with grandma is now out with nothing and nobody. So again, that's just something that one of those specific situations that, you know, is, is not necessarily general, but I just like to throw that out there because more and more people are raising grandkids and that's something that they don't often think about is what happens when I'm gone. Um, the next question um, is from Anne. Um, who to designate as a, as a successor trustee if a person is single and their only family are their parents? Ah, that's a common one, actually. Um, generally, what we would recommend, if you don't have a really good friend that you trust, some people do. Um, some people have nieces, nephews, a little more distant relatives. But again, if you really don't have, if those aren't good options for you, we, we will usually recommend a professional fiduciary. And a professional fiduciary is someone that's licensed and bonded, and this is what they do for a living. Um, there's an association called the Professionary, Professional Fiduciary Association of California. That's PFAC, PFAC, and they have a website. If you wanted to Google that, you'll see there's a whole lot of people that serve as professional fiduciaries. Like I say, they're bonded and licensed. So these are people that have gone through some rigorous you know, background checks, that sort of thing. Um, oftentimes what we'll do, because if you're fine right now, it doesn't help for you to interview a bunch of professionals, pick one out now, and then you're fine for the next 20 or 30 years. And that person has long ago retired um, and now you're stuck with nobody. So generally what we do in documents is we will, we will set up a process for appointing a professional. So that's where instead of saying, this is the person who I want to act for me, we'll say, this is the person I want to find a, an independent professional fiduciary to serve as my agent or my trustee, whatever that is. Um, and the person that we designate to be the point person, not to act, but to find somebody that can be acting on a long-term basis is generally, again, either a trusted family member, somebody maybe you don't want to, or friend, you don't want to burden them with taking care of stuff, but you trust them to go out in the community and say, okay, you know, how do I find a good professional, you know, and hook you up? Or oftentimes we'll say, my most recent estate planning attorney, my CPA, my financial advisor, some trusted professional that you're working with that knows you and that, but doesn't necessarily want to step into the shoes of managing your assets, but that's a good point person that can go out in the community and say, okay, who are the current professionals that are, that are working, who's good, and set them up to be able to take over. So that's generally what we recommend in those, those kind of circumstances. Julie was talking about some documents, advanced advanced healthcare directives and such. I have links on that resource list to the documents um, for California. Um, 
And again, with those documents, it's so important that they are state specific. The posts are state specific. So, you know, it's important that you pay attention to that part of it. So I think we kind of talked about the estate planning documents, funding your trust, you know, protecting against the probate court. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is a little bit about public benefits. So generally, you know, obviously there's all kinds of different public benefits. There's there's welfare programs and there's cash aid programs. There's all kinds of them. But the primary ones that I want to address today are those dealing with long-term care issues. So generally that's gonna be Medi-Cal. Now, again, Medi-Cal has a number of programs. There's, there's programs for pregnant women, for women with children, for people out in the community, for people in long-term care facilities. So each one of those is a different program. The primary ones that people usually get mixed up is, is the uh, covered California kind of program and the long-term care program. So one is kind of Obamacare medical insurance, whereas the long-term care Medi-Cal program is specific to nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities, or you know, in the old days known as convalescent hospitals. Um, so, so the Obamacare Medi-Cal program is dealing with, again, medical insurance for just basic hospitals, doctors, that sort of thing. That program is based on income only. There's no asset test, um, but generally once you hit 65, then you're switching from that Medi-Cal program to Medicare. And then usually you'll have some kind of a supplemental insurance policy that goes along with the Medicare. So Medicare has different options. One is the plan C, which is things like uh, Kaiser, I think Secure Horizons, I can't remember the other ones, where it's all inclusive. It's, it basically covers all of your medical um, needs, including medications, sometimes um, glasses, hearing aids, all that kind of stuff, very all inclusive, as opposed to traditional Medicare, where they generally pay 80% of certain expenses. Um, and that's, uh, so that's where we usually say, well, you're gonna want a supplemental for that other 20%. That supplemental can be just a regular, you know, AARP kind of United Healthcare Program or Blue Shield or whatever, or it could be Medi-Cal, you know, if your income is low enough to be your supplemental policy. And I know there's gonna be a webinar directly on Medicare, so I'm not gonna get any farther into it than that because I know the people that are gonna be speaking at that are the Medicare experts. And honestly, when people call my office and have very detailed Medicare uh, questions, I pretty much always refer them to HICAP, which is health insurance, something, I can't remember. But anyway, that's who's gonna be talking at the Medicare seminar. So I, I def definitely recommend if you have any Medicare questions, you know, attend that seminar. I think it'll be really helpful. So the Medi-Cal that I'm primarily talking about is for nursing home. And a lot of times people get mixed up and they think, oh, well, you know, my mom's in a facility, can she get Medi-Cal? Well, not just any facility, it has to be a skilled nursing facility that is contracted with Medi-Cal. So most of the skilled nursing facilities are contracted with Medi-Cal, but places like memory care are not. So it may seem like the same thing, but it's not. It's under a different license and therefore Medi-Cal is not going to cover that. So when we're looking at Medi-Cal, we're really looking at kind of a very small window of people that it can help. But for those people, it's a lifesaver. So that's why I want to talk about it. Um, but let me quickly go through kind of the, the different levels of care that end you up in that skilled facility. So generally, people start off at home. They may need somebody just to come in once in a while to help them out. That's, that you know, you're basically private paying for that. Sometimes if it's a short-term medical condition, you can get some outpatient physical therapy or something like that. But actual caregiving, somebody to help you cook your meals, go to the bathroom, things like that, you're gonna pay privately for. Um, when you get to the point where you have so many hours a day that you need help with, it gets cost prohibitive, basically because you're paying one on one for somebody to come help you. That's where sometimes we may need to look at moving into a facility. Now, there's assisted living facilities and there's board and care facilities. 
They're kind of, in, in some ways they overlap, but the assisted living facilities, which are often um, known as memory care facilities, oftentimes they don't have the memory care component or that's not their specialty, but it's any kind of assisted care that someone needs. But that's generally where there's a lot more activities and programs and, and you, you generally have your own apartment, a small apartment, but they have you know community meals in a in a dining room and and like I say activities. They'll take you on trips to parks or you know shopping that sort of thing. Um, again, depending on your level of need, memory care generally they're not taking you out, but the facility and the care is all directed around people that have memory issues and potentially may wander off. Sometimes they're locked. Sometimes they just have creative decorating. I saw one place I thought was really cool. They had a, just a bookcase on a wall and there was actually a door in it, but you couldn't tell because it was painted like it was a bookcase. So people didn't know where the door was um, and they're fine with it, you know? I mean, as long as they don't see it and go, oh, I need to leave, then, you know, out of sight, out of mind oftentimes, so um, memory care is generally more focused for that kind of thing, but still they usually have activities, that sort of thing. A boarding care usually is for people that maybe have a little bit more advanced dementia or more physical needs than assisted living can help. Assisted living, you could be in a wheelchair, but primarily you're more mobile. In boarding cares often that's when you're really less mobile, um, less involved in the environment. As dementias progress, generally we get more and more withdrawn and we don't really care to be in activities. We either don't understand them, we can't hear, we can't, we just can't be involved and we really just kind of don't care. So that's where sometimes a boarding care facility is a better location to get that level of care because you're not paying for all those activities that you're not going to use anyway. So you're just basically paying for the care. Um, and now boarding care facilities are generally residential homes that have been turned into and licensed as a board and care facility. Usually there are people that, you know, the caregivers live there and they can have rotating staff, but, you know, night staff and day staff, that sort of thing. But, they're, but there's somebody there 24 hours a day. Some of them have registered nurses on staff so they can actually handle more physical things almost at a skilled level. Um, some of them don't, they just provide the basic living, you know, uh, keeping you clean and fed. And usually they'll have you sit in front of the TV, again, something just to look at, but um, there's not a whole lot going on in those facilities, but they can be really good. Generally, my experience is most of them have very loving caregivers that, that really do care. And you develop a relationship with them. They almost become like a second family. So that's another level. As I mentioned, sometimes they'll have a registered nurse on site, but most of them don't. So if you get to the point where you really need physical care, so oftentimes you fall, you break a hip, you got, you know, all the, you had a drain, you got, you know, the recovery of that. Um, some things like Parkinson's disease, you often have swallowing issues where you tend to aspirate, which will get you pneumonia and potentially die. So we want you monitored much closer when you have those kind of things. And that's where a skilled facility would, would be the place. In the old days, anybody that had dementia would go there because there weren't other options. Um, unfortunately, now, unfortunately and unfortunately, fortunately, there's other options if you can afford to pay for them. Unfortunately, you don't get Medi-Cal helping with the payment. So it can get really expensive, even though it's great care. Sometimes we want to be in the nursing home because you're at a point where you need so much care and it's just too expensive in one of those other types of facilities. So generally for a skilled nursing facility, what the usual route into one of those facilities is you have some sort of medical event you go into the hospital. You do have to be in the hospital for three solid days before Medicare will pay for you to go to the nursing home under rehabilitation. And that Medicare rehabilitation is only gonna be a maximum of 100 days. But the whole point is you've had a medical event, you need some time to get strong again, get back to baseline and then get home. Um, but oftentimes, 
that's kind of our step into the facility, knowing that we really are going to want to stay there long term, because for whatever reason, the other place that you are living, whether it's home or another lower level facility, is just not meeting your needs, or it's so expensive, you just can't afford it any longer. So that's where um, we're looking at Medicare just as the in to get into the facility. Once you're in there, there's going to come a time when the facility is going to say you're ready for discharge. And, uh, you know, if you've ever experienced nursing homes, they're just going to say, okay, we're planning for discharge on Tuesday. And you're just like, what? You know, um, basically, the, the criteria for Medicare to discharge you from the nursing home. And again, when we talk discharge from Medicare, we're talking discharge from Medicare paying for it. We're not saying you physically have to leave the facility. You're just gonna have to come up with another payment source. So I have had a number of people that came to me and they brought a loved one home because they were told the loved one was ready for discharge and they can't take care of them at all at home. And it's like, no, it just meant that, you know, but, but that's what they're gonna say, we're discharging. So that's where we generally will wanna talk about, can this person stay on as a long-term resident as opposed to a short-term rehab person? So that's kind of a song and dance to get the facility to accept them as a long-term resident. But, um, and usually what we'll do, this is just kind of the game you have to play, is when Medicare is running out, we will, we will say, we wanna stay on and we will privately pay. And you will pay that first month's deposit cash. So you'll hand them a check for $8,000 or whatever amount they're asking for. Once you have secured that bed, they've accepted your payment, you now have that bed. Then by law, if you switch payment source to Medi-Cal, they cannot kick you out. So that's where you're, you're safe in that, you know, you're switching to Medi-Cal, they can't say, oh, wait a minute, you can't afford us anymore, you gotta go. They're not allowed to do that. That being said, when you're leaving Medicare, if they haven't committed to a long-term bed there, they can say, we don't have any beds. So that's why we generally don't want you to go from Medicare and say, yeah, I'm applying for Medi-Cal, can I stay? Their first thought is gonna be, no, we'd rather get somebody that's private pay. So no, you can't stay, there's no beds. You know, so what we want to do is get that in with that initial deposit. And then once you've got that initial deposit in, we'll look at, and obviously we've looked at this previously, because as I said, if you've got your estate plan in order, we already have plans for, you know, future events. But at that point, we're going to say, okay, what assets do I have right now? Where am I at with the qualification for eligibility for Medi-Cal? And what can we do to get me qualified? obviously right away because I'm already in the nursing home and then switch over, you know, apply for Medi-Cal and switch over to Medi-Cal paying. Um, so the Medi-Cal rules are changing just this year. They went, I mean, it's kind of a crazy change. They went from an asset limit of $2,000 to $130,000. And I went to a conference recently and people looked at me just like crazy because the rest of the country thinks we're insane because they still have the $2,000 limits. And it's like, you can have how much money and be in the nursing home and Medi-Cal pays for it. But that's what it is in California, which is really helpful for those people that don't have enough to privately pay forever or even for very long, but they have too much, they have more than $2,000. So that's where, you know, the 130 is, is more doable. If you are a couple and one of the spouses is going into the nursing home, you can actually have $195,000. Now, in Jan I think it's January of 2024, that asset test is supposed to go away completely, kind of like Obamacare, where there's no, they don't care how much money you have, it's all income based. So basically, anybody could qualify for Medi Cal. But your share of cost or your co-payment will be based on your income. So I don't know how that's going to play out because I don't think California can afford for everybody to be on Medi-Cal. Um, what I'm seeing even now with the expansion of Medi-Cal is that it's easier to get the benefit than it is to find a place that will accept Medi-Cal to pay for it. A lot of doctors are saying, I'm not taking Medi-Cal anymore. They don't pay me any money. So I'm only going to take private pay or, you know, medical insurance. 
So unfortunately, that's the political reality of, yeah, it's great. Everybody's qualified for Medi-Cal, but what good is it if nobody takes that as, as a payment source? So, but that's down the road, we'll see. In the meantime, if you qualify, you're in the nursing home, we can get Medi-Cal to pay. Now, that being said, again, we're looking at the assets. I've talked about that. It's also an income-based thing, which is basically how much income you have will, uh, will determine what your co-payment, or we call it share of cost, is. So Medi-Cal will look at your income, will look at your assets, they'll say, okay, you qualify, you're eligible, but your share of cost is X number of dollars. Essentially, what they're going to do is they're going to take your income, they're going to give you your um, your um, maintenance allowance, your spending allowance, which right now is $35 a month. But if you're in the nursing home, they're pretty much paying for everything. So, okay, you get $35 a month to get your hair done or whatever. But certainly if you want a telephone or something, that's not going to cover it. So it's not much, but they'll subtract that from your income. And then the rest of your income is going to go either to the nursing home or to your medical premiums. You know, so if you have any medical insurance premiums, it, it would come out of that part too. But essentially your share of cost is all of your income, except for that $35. Now, again, if you are married, there's an allocation for the spouse at home. So, you know, our, our public policy is we don't want to take all the income from that spouse, give it to the nursing home. And then that's the spouse at home becomes destitute and now dependent on welfare, you know, because they can't afford to live. So our policy is that a certain amount of income will be allocated to that spouse. And again, I don't want to get into all the numbers, but essentially the spouse at home has really high income then none of the spouse in the nursing home's income will be allocated to them because the government feels like, well, that spouse has enough money. But if that spouse at home has very low income, a certain amount up to all of the spouse that's in the nursing home, their income can be, can be transferred over to the spouse at home up to whatever the limit is. It's around $3,500 a month. So again, they'll combine those and then whatever overage is above that $3,500, of the spouse that's in the nursing home, then they'll count that as your, your co-payment or share of cost. So that's kind of the way the finances works. Once you're in the nursing home, once you're on, as I said, can't kick you out when you switch to Medi-Cal. If you go into the hospital, by law, they have to hold your bed for seven days. I've had this with a bunch of people where they're in the hospital a little bit longer. After seven days, they do require that you pay privately to continue to hold that bed. You can choose not to, in which case the facility can give your bed away. But when you're ready to come back, they have to give you the first available bed. So you may not have the same room, but and, and we don't know how long it takes to get that first available bed because there's often a waiting list. But technically, they're supposed to get you back. I have had a lot of families say, I'll just pony up the money and make sure that we've got a room when we go back. But that's a decision to be made at that time. So that's kind of how the Medi-Cal works for the nursing home. Um, again, going back to if we're starting in the hospital and going through Medicare and Medicare tells you the ready for discharge. Um, I want to go over real quick because a lot of times people don't know how to deal with that. By law, the facility has to give you a piece of paper that basically tells you your rights and says that Medicare is discharging you. On the back of that piece of paper, and it's a standard form, there is a phone number for you to appeal. So if you have not used up your 100 days, you can potentially appeal that decision and say, I still need this level of care. Now, I've had a lot of people try and appeal it and say, I'm a little old lady at home and I can't take care of my husband. It's too hard. I, I hate to say it, but they don't care. Um, they, they only care about the legal criteria. And as sad as that story is, what you need to show them is that the person that they're discharging needs that level of care to maintain the function that they have. A lot of times the facility and the, the physical therapists and the discharge planners are going to say, he's not progressing anymore. That used to, well, I don't even know if it used to be the, the, the criteria, but they used to get away with it. They no longer get away with that because the legal criteria is not that you have to be getting better. 
but just that you need those services to, to maintain what you've got. So let's say they're doing physical therapy on your hand, you know, and they're doing it every single day. And if they stopped that, your hand would contract and you'd lose all use of it pretty much for the rest of your life once it contracts. That's where you want to maybe appeal and say, if my mom loses this level of care, then she's going to lose all motion of her hand. And I'm just using this as an example. Whatever your, your situation is, is what you're going to argue that they need this level of physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, whatever it is the therapies are that they're getting, they need that just to maintain. Whether they're getting better or not doesn't matter. Um, and so you can appeal that and then and then a review board will determine whether you win your appeal or not. You can continue appealing that. I have not found that very effective and it gets expensive at a certain point. So generally that first appeal is as far as we usually go, but it kind of depends. Um, so, so I just want you to know your rights when they say, you know, you're ready for discharge. Really look at the situation. If you haven't used your full 100 days and you really feel you still need that level of care, that's going to be your argument is, is that level of care that they're giving is necessary as opposed to, I can't get that level of care. I can't provide that level of care. That's not the argument. It's that they need it and they still have time, you know, under their Medicare 100 days. So again, that's, that's just kind of a, a trick that's really important because I've had so many people think, okay, that's it. I'm done. Well, not necessarily. Um, but it has to be a legitimate need. It's not like, you know, I don't know what to do. So let's just, you know, I mean, you can certainly try it, but they will look at it and see if legitimately you do still need that level of care. But then the other thing is just negotiating with the nursing home to keep you on as a long-term resident, as opposed to a rehab person that's getting that, that kind of therapy. And our goal is always, if we can get Medi-Cal to pay the basic expenses, then maybe you can use your private money that you've saved to cover a little extra therapy. If it's not covered under your medical insurance and you wanna have a physical therapist come in and help or you know whatever, massage therapist, anything to supplement to make things better, but it's not covered under the Medicare or the you know, health insurance issues. You, you know, if you're not paying that $10,000 a month to the facility where you don't have a penny to, to pay for anything, if Medi-Cal is paying the primary expenses, you might be able to afford to supplement. And that's always our goal because, you know, nursing home level of care is pretty much just the basics. So if you can supplement, you can make life a lot, a lot more comfortable and better for people that are in the nursing home. So that's kind of the Medi-Cal program. There is a program for home care called in-home support services. Um, your income needs to be really low to qualify for that. So, you know, and a lot of times I'm like, I have one right now where the husband was working, the wife is disabled, but the husband now has to care for his wife 24 hours a day. So he lost his job. So their income plummeted. So now they are going for the in-home support services basically to pay the husband as a caregiver because they don't have the income to you know, pay for somebody independently. Um, so that is a program that is available, but it really is very income dependent. And for most people, it's not gonna give you much benefit, but there are some where it does. So again, it's always something to look into. So, um, so that's the Medi-Cal. Now, now I kind of went really briefly over that. So are there any questions at this point on Medi-Cal those kind of programs, anything that I've missed that, that has come up in your life that you have questions about? Um, I don't know if there's any questions in the Q&A. Yeah, there aren't, any, there aren't any questions, but to give people an opportunity, um, maybe to type one in right now, um, I'll just interject a little bit. Um, on the online resource list that I made available to everybody, um, there is a really good resource from Canner um, that gives you every imaginable detail about Medi-Cal. And the good thing about Canner is they make sure that they update their information all the time. And so I don't know that they have the new asset info on there yet. Cause I think, I think they do. They do. So then, then, it up. 
Yeah. So there, that's a really great resource for you. Um, the other thing is in January, I'm doing a webinar that's going to look at all of the different options for providing care from independent mm -hmm to assisted, board and care, skilled nursing facilities. Um, we'll look at costs, we'll look at services. Um, mm -hmm. We'll kind of look at the ins and outs that Julie was talking about with regard to how to protect your, your room, your place, if you happen to get in a skilled nursing facility and then ultimately go on to Medi-Cal. And then the webinar that I'm gonna do in, uh, I, it's either March or April, um, is called Navigating the Healthcare Environment, Becoming an Advocate for Yourself and Your Loved One. And that one goes into all of those Medicare rights that Julie was just talking about. So lots of details on how to appeal a discharge, how to, how to protect your in-home care services like physical therapy and occupational therapy and all of that. Cause these are gigantic, gigantic topics. So um, I don't want you to feel like um, Julie's done an excellent job, you know, of covering all of those. Um, but if, if you want more um, we've got some, some opportunities for you. All right. Absolutely. I yeah. I mean, the whole goal today, because I don't have time to get really in depth is to give you that general overview. And again, um, bring up issues that you may want more information. And I am so impressed with the, the topics that Debbie's offering. They are incredible, totally relevant topics to what a lot of you are dealing with or will deal with. So I highly recommend that you attend those sessions too, because you know each of these areas is very specific and you can do an entire session on it. Whereas I'm kind of just doing a very broad overview of, of all of these issues. So um, again, I, I do recommend that you attend those, those sessions too. So, I love having the, the legal aspect of it, Julie, because the, you know, the legal aspect and kind of more the practical, they're two different things. So, you know, I they are, but they go hand in hand. So absolutely. I think you need hand. to, you, if you don't have your legal stuff in order, it's going to be hard on the practical level, but even with the legal stuff in order, if you don't know what to do on a practical level, it's really, really hard. So, you know, again, you really need to look at both. You know, have your plans in advance. Have your have your um, documents done properly. Assets titled properly. Properly learn learn about Medicare as it becomes an issue. Learn about you know the levels of care, especially if you've got a diagnosis of anything, even if it's an early diagnosis. And we kind of know what the tra trajectory is. Know in advance. You know, I'm just a firm believer in get as much information as you can, and that way you kind of know what your options are. It's really hard when you don't know what you don't know. And so seeking out professionals, depending on what the situation is, is really, really important. But again, just getting this information and having some knowledge of the basics, we don't expect you to be an expert, but at least you kind of know the basics of when do I need help and where do I reach out for that help and what can I do on my own kind of thing is is really important yes yeah. so so good information so moving on I we don't have a lot of time I want to real quickly touch on the VA benefits now obviously if you're not a veteran or a surviving spouse of a veteran or a dependent of a veteran then this won't apply to you but I'm it, it'll be brief so um I just want to let you know that there are some veterans benefits for chronic long-term health issues. So um, the veterans actually have um, care homes. There's not a ton of them. I want to say there's eight or 10 of them throughout the state of California. Most of them have waiting lists, but they actually have different levels of care all the way from independent to assisted to skilled and for veterans and their spouses. That can sometimes be a great place to go where you really have a lot of socialization. Um, they got all kinds of activities. I think the, the most local ones are in Yountville and, um, oh, I forget, they, they open one, I can't remember where, but you can go on, it's CalVet Homes. You can Google that and see where they are throughout the state. And again, um, as a veteran or, or a spouse of a veteran, you may qualify to move into one of those facilities. Those facilities are generally based on income. So you're not necessarily gonna pay the same amount as somebody else. 
So it's a percentage of your income. So, um, but what's happening is the VA is supplementing. Obviously you're not paying the full cost of everything that you're getting. So they're supplementing. And once you're in one of those places, one of the concerns I've had people call me about is they will send you a statement, which looks like a bill. And basically it's, here's what we have funded for you and you owe us. You actually don't owe it during life, but after life, they will come back to your estate to take back whatever amount has accrued. Um, but most of those, those VA homes are really good about saying, talk to an elder law attorney because you can protect that. Because as long as you don't have anything that's gonna go through your estate, VA will not, will not claim it. So a lot of times, once somebody goes into one of those places, we will move their assets to a special kind of trust so that when you die, that whole bill goes away. But, um, but that is a, a resource. There are also, um, VA has some board and care type of facilities in the communities, a little bit tougher to find. But the other, um, the other one I wanna talk about, VA has a pension program, which is not for retired people. If you're a retired veteran, you'll get your retirement, but this is in addition to that, or if you don't have that standing alone. For veterans that have care needs, but they had to have served during wartime. Now, throughout our history, we've had a lot of wars. So a lot of the older vets do qualify, although there were a few years there in the 50s where we were sort of officially in between wars. So unfortunately, if you served at the wrong dates, you might not qualify. But I always recommend if you're a veteran that's needing care now, check it out, see if your dates of service fall into any of those wartime periods, because if they do, you may qualify for this benefit. And basically this pension program, the purpose of it is to reimburse you for the cost of care that's not paid for in some other way. So obviously if your medical insurance is covering it or you have high income that covers it, they're gonna say, well, you have money that covers it. But essentially if you're spending all your income on your care and you have nothing left, that's where the VA, and we call it aid and attendance, although that's the highest level. It is actually a pension program that pays some lower levels too, but a lot of people just call it aid and attendance just because that's the common name. But essentially, they will give you a reimbursement up to a set amount. So again, depending if you're the veteran yourself, you're the surviving spouse of a veteran, two spouses that both served, together, or not necessarily together, but both served as veterans, there's different amounts that you qualify for depending on what, what um, category you fall into. And then there's also different amounts based on the level of care you need. So the first level of care is really basic. If you're over the age of 65, you're considered disabled, which I find very amusing. But back in the day, 65 year olds were old and okay, 65 now is not old. But for the VA purposes, that's the age they use where you are now considered a senior and disabled. So that's one of the criteria. Um, the next step would be homebound, where you, you, you don't need a lot of care, but you can't get out. You're, you know, your mobility issues, whatever, you're really pretty much bound at home. Not that you can't make it to a doctor, but it's really difficult. So you get a higher level of pension for that. And then, and then the, the upper level is that aid and attendance where you actually need somebody to assist you with basic living skills. That's bathing, dressing, feeding yourself, uh, that sort of thing. Dementia does fall into that if you need standby assistance. So you may be able to do these things, but because your brain isn't functioning properly, you don't know to do them or you'll do them in such a way that you might hurt yourself you know, that, that does constitute one of their criteria. So, so again, depending on what your level of care need is, um, that will tell what the maximum amount is. And then they'll determine, do you get the maximum amount or a lesser amount based on your financial numbers, which we don't really have time to get into here today, but it is kind of a sliding scale with income, um, which is offset by the expenses that you pay for your healthcare. 
if you're in assisted living, that entire cost counts as an expense that can be reimbursed. Whereas, you know, if you're in independent living, it doesn't, but any care that you're provided in that independent living would count. So again, kind of complicated. I definitely would not try to figure this out on your own. Um, there are VSO representatives that um, you know, through through the VA that they can help you for no charge. I have found if your if your situation is very complex, they basically do the real basic stuff, and they're not going to be able to give you legal advice as to you don't qualify now, but there's things you could do to qualify that sort of thing. That's where you want to talk to an elder law attorney that is VA accredited. Um, uh, where we can look at, you know, what's the eligibility criteria? What is your situation? What can be done or what can't be done? When could we get you qualified? How much could we get you qualified for that sort of thing? So, so I definitely recommend for veterans and their spouses, and even if you have a dependent adult child that, you know, potentially could get some of those benefits based on the veteran. Um, if you have care needs, definitely seek out an elder law attorney, find out, I mean, essentially if someone comes to me and it looks like their situation is they are qualified, you know, they're ready to go. I will usually send you to the VSO because they, that's what they do. And, and nobody charges for assisting with the, with the VA application. I don't charge for it. They don't charge for it. But I do charge for the legal part of, you know, doing the planning, the documents, that sort of thing. So if you don't need that kind of thing, the VSO is free. And unfortunately, I can only do so many pro bono before I run out of business. And I can, you know, so I do have to do the legal work, too. So if it can save you money, I'll say, yep, you're good to go. Here's the VSO. Go work with them. You'll, they'll get you qualified. If we need to do planning and stuff, that's where generally you would hire us. We'll do all whatever needs to be done and then later apply for the benefits. So that, again, would cover home care, um, facility care. Um, it can cover nursing home care, but usually the, the Medi-Cal is the program. We're going to go for that. If you have already started receiving the VA income and you go into a nursing home, and you now qualify for Medi-Cal, you will continue getting that VA, but they're gonna drop it down to $95 a month. But that's money that's in addition to the 35 that the Medi-Cal lets you keep. Medi-Cal will not take that 95. So you won't get the full benefit you were getting, but Medicare's or Medi-Cal's paying most of your way and you'll get a little extra spending money. So it doesn't stop if you're in the nursing home, but generally if you're going into a nursing home, that's not the time we would apply for it because it's not worth it. Um, you know, if you're gonna have Medi-Cal pay the bulk of it anyway. So that's kind of a few of the VA things that we always want people to know about. Obviously it's a way bigger subject. Um, if you're a veteran, definitely seek out some assistance either from the VSO or from uh, an elder law attorney. I would be careful. Sometimes there are, and this is both Medi-Cal and VA, there are planners that call themselves VA planners or Medi-Cal planners, that sort of thing. It are usually insurance salesmen. Sometimes they're just sort of paralegals that say, oh, I've been doing this forever. And um, I've had a lot of really bad experiences where they really steered people wrong, charged them all kinds of money, and we have to undo things they've done. So be really careful not to just grab anybody. You really want to get somebody that's a vetted source of good information. If you're just going online, there, there you can get anything online, whether it's accurate or not. Generally, I hate to say it's usually not. Um, so you definitely want to go to a trusted source, and that's where the links that Debbie offers um, or, you know, a good elder law attorney can help you with that. So on that note, any questions on the VA? I did go very quickly. I don't know if many of you are even vets, if that's an issue, but I did want to bring it up. Um, and yeah, I, don't... I don't see any questions um, in the question box. Um, okay. It's... Okay. So the other thing I just want to real quickly um, go over is, is elder abuse and fraud and that sort of thing. It's happening. I, I want I want to say it's not any more than it used to be because, it, you know, it, it's been a problem for a long time, but it kind of is, seems like it's growing. Um, and what we have found, at least historically, is that our senior generation, 
used to be anyway, very trusting. We still have a lot of trusting people, although as the baby boomers age, we're not as trusting. So in a way that's better, it's kind of sad, but, um, but there are so many different ways that people can defraud or abuse elders. So um, we just kind of talk about a few of the marketing things. You know, we'd get people that come to the door and say, you know, we're in the area doing, you know, checking roofs. And do you want us to check your roof for free? And then they'll come up with, oh, you have all this horrible stuff. You need $15,000 worth of roofing. Um, the primary thing with those kinds of unsolicited marketing things is I would be working with the senior or if it's you to always have a trusted source to, to ask, what do you think? So if somebody comes to your door, don't just talk to them alone and say, okay, if you say that's what I need, okay. Say, okay, I'm gonna have to think about it or whatever. Contact your child or your trusted person and say, here's what they're saying, what do you think? And um, because they can be very convincing and oftentimes it's a scam. So, you know, again, just having in advance a plan for if somebody comes to you and says, you have to have this, check it out with somebody you trust before you just jump on it. Now, as far as elder abuse, a lot of times, I hate to say it, but it's family members that abuse seniors or disabled people. And whether it's intentional or negligent, I obviously negligent doesn't seem as bad as intentional. I mean, if you're beating up your parent, that's just egregious, it's horrible, it's criminal. But negligence is too, if you take on the role as I'm gonna have my mom live with me and I'm gonna take care of her, but I ignore her and I go about my stuff and I leave her all alone and I don't leave food for her, that sort of thing. That is abuse too. If you're gonna take on the role of being a caregiver or having that person dependent on you, you have an obligation, a legal obligation to take care of them. So, and we do have families that don't. Um, there's also financial abuse. You know, a lot of times it'll be one of the children that's always depended on mom and dad to, you know, bail them out. And next thing you know, they're on title of the house and that sort of thing. So again, you know, we always want seniors to have a trusted person, somebody that maybe isn't a dependent relative that they can turn to, to say, what do you think? Is this a good idea? You know, it's somebody to protect you. Certainly, if you suspect abuse and you don't have a trusted person, Adult Protective Services is someone that you can call. Um, and I think there were some other resources in the materials of other, other organizations, but there is help out there. Um, but prevention is always better than trying to get it back in the end. You know, obviously with negligence and neglect, you know, you'll have physical injuries, which, you know, sometimes you can never recover from with financial. Again, once the money's gone, and unfortunately, the kind of people that steal money usually don't have it to get back, even if you catch them. So, um, for example, my sister was the victim of, of a scam, and she gave them $150,000, just pretty much everything she had. And um, in her case, she's a very, very bright person, but very insecure as a mental illness. And she trusted them. They told her they were her best friend and they were gonna take care of her forever. Um, and even when the police came along, they tried to enlist my help to work with her on their case against them. And she, you know, and this happens a lot. Seniors are so embarrassed that they could have been taken and they just cannot fathom that this person they trusted so much has, you know, betrayed them. And so they won't follow up, which is what my sister ended up doing. She would not work with these people. Um, not that she would have gotten the money back anyway. Like I say, when it's a scam, they usually, they get that money out of there and it's protected for them. Um, but, um, but you want to prevent it as opposed to trying to deal with it after the fact. So, you know, we get the Jamaican callers, lots of phone calls, you know, grandma, this is your grandchild, you know, something happened, I need money, things like that. We've all heard those stories. Always, always be careful of those kind of phone calls. Always vet it before you ever send anybody any money and talk to vet trusted people. So I just wanted to throw that out there. I personally do not handle elder abuse actions because those are generally 
court things where you're suing and that sort of thing, or they're criminal matters. Um, but I certainly have people I can refer to if you have a situation like that. Uh, we have litigators that we can say, here's a good person, talk to them, they can help you out. So I wanted to throw that out there. One more thing, reverse mortgages um, can be a godsend for people that wanna stay in their home forever or as long as possible. And they really don't have any money except for the equity in the house. That is a good way to draw money out. You don't have to make payments during your life. They've put a lot of protections in the law for reverse mortgages, but there are still times when uh, people kind of push people into that when it's not necessarily a good idea. For most of my clients, I don't recommend it because it's very, um, very expensive. Even though you pay on the back end, the fees are very, very high. So if you have other ways of getting money to pay for things, or if you're not gonna be able to stay in the house for a long time, it's a requirement you live there. So if you think within the next six months, you're gonna to have to move to a facility, you don't wanna get a reverse mortgage. You're gonna pay all those upfront fees. And then when you move to the facility, you're gonna to have to sell the house or some other find some other funds to pay it off with all those fees. So it's only for some certain circumstances where you're planning on living there for a long time, you really don't have any other avenues for assets um, or income to cover expenses. So again, it's a great thing in the right circumstances, but don't just jump on it, you know, because, you know, famous people tout it on the, on the TV, which I see all the time. Um, sometimes it, it's okay and sometimes it's not. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I have um, missed. I think I've talked mostly about, I mean, one other thing, just real quickly, the difference between an estate planning attorney and an elder law attorney, just so you kind of know, it's like, what is the difference? Estate planning attorneys historically are really looking at protecting against taxes, protecting against probate. They absolutely can do powers of attorney, healthcare directives, trust wills. So a lot of the documents are the same, but their focus is more on death planning. Elder law attorneys are generally more focused on life and death planning and not as much about taxes, but definitely taxes is an issue. But we're more looking at what happens if you live a really long time and you're spending your money on care? How do we protect your estate? How do we try and make it so that you don't run out of money before the end of your life? So we're, we're doing some a little bit more. I, I kind of call it estate planning on steroids. It's like we're doing the same documents, but we're putting a lot more fancy language in those documents. We're making sure things are set up for those healthcare issues. And we're looking at you know, crisis management when you really are dealing with those health issues. What do we do right now? Whereas an estate planner is generally gonna set up your plan and you know they're available if you want to make changes, but they're not dealing with the crisis stuff quite so much. So I just wanted to kind of give you that difference. So when you're looking for an attorney, you're kind of seeing if you're young and healthy, an estate planning attorney is probably a perfectly fine way to go. Um, but when you're dealing with health issues and aging issues and Medi-Cal, VA, asset protection, um, other than just straight tax asset protection, an elder law attorney is usually your better bet at that point. So I think I've covered everything and I think I've run a little bit late, but um, I don't see any other questions in the Q&A. Certainly if any of you have questions that come up later, um, you'll have my contact information, or if you can't find that, you can always call Debbie or email her and get my contact information. And as I said, some of these areas that you may wanna get a little more deeper information attend some of the other webinars. And um, I wish all of you the best of luck and I hope everything goes well. And we're here to help if you do need any assistance with your estate plan or care of a loved one, any of your legal needs. Thanks.